Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming, and uh, welcome to uh, Johns Hopkins University. For those of you that this is their first time here, uh, my name is Will Burns, and I direct the uh, Energy Policy and Climate Program here at Hopkins. And uh, we're really pleased to be part of, uh, of Ecologic's uh, uh, anniversary uh, week uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, I think this is a particularly important time for uh, Europeans to tell the message about what's happening in terms of European energy and climate policy. Uh, the Washington, D.C. and the, this country in many ways are a swirl with lots of negative stories about what's happening in Europe. Uh, many of you probably saw the Washington Post piece yesterday uh, that described uh, European governments have, as having, quote, proven themselves to be incompetent, central planners, counterproductive, and wary of thinking pragmatically when it comes to climate and energy policy. And in many ways, the editorial, in my opinion, is full of uh, half-truths, mistruths, untruths. Um, but the point is, is that given how critical uh, Europe is in terms of a model for emissions trading, a model for efficiency uh, uh, planning, etc., it's really critical for Europe to clearly and effectively communicate what's working and your vision for the future as a, as a model, in my opinion, for, for energy and, uh, and climate policy making. So we welcome you to Hopkins as, as part of that uh, narrative. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Michael Mayling, the president of Ecologic in Washington, to introduce today's speaker. Michael. Thank you very much, Will, and, and thanks for hosting us for this event and also two earlier events today. It really helped us out um, with that. Um, Ecologic Institute is probably an organization that many of you are not familiar with because it's only been here in the U.S. for five years. This is our fifth anniversary week. And, um, but in Europe, it's, it's much better known. It's one of the largest independent nonprofit environmental policy think tanks since uh, 1995. And one of the issues that we address and deal with along with a range of other environmental policy issues and issues at the cross-section of environment and trade, agriculture, et cetera, is climate and energy policy, of course. I'd invite you to grab one of our brochures before you head out, which describes activities here in the US, but also in Europe. But as Will said, and I couldn't agree more with you, the editorial yesterday was definitely full of lots of oversimplifications. The, the, the topic is very complex. And one project that Ecologic Institute is involved in um, is, a, is a very large-scale, multi-year um, research project um, called Sicilia, which deals with sort of long-term climate policy options for the European Union. It's led by Matthias Duve, my colleague in Berlin, who heads the climate and energy team there. And um, he'll present some of the initial scoping and thoughts that are coming out of that project to really try to provide the European Union with options and um, alternatives going forward with climate policy. So Matthias, my pleasure to hand over to you. And looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Will, for the opportunity to speak here, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Of course, I need to briefly present the project that uh, Michael mentioned, give you a sense of uh, what we are looking at in the work that we're doing um, under the project. Uh, then I wanted to give you a brief background on the challenge that we're facing um, for 2050 and from that move on to look at the policies that can help us trigger the kind of transformation of our economies uh, that are required to achieve decarbonization. And to do that, I'm, I'm going to look back a little bit at the history of policy and climate policy development in Europe and Germany in particular, and uh, try to show you how these policies have tried to um, evolve and have been developed further uh, over the, the past 10 to 20 years. And from that I'll be moving into the questions that we're facing right now with regard to extending, expanding and further improving these sets of policies for them to be able to actually help us uh, achieve the much deeper emission reductions that we're needing um, by the middle of the century. And as an important part of that I'm hoping to also um, give you a few uh, thoughts from a European perspective on the role of the United States um, in the interactions on climate and energy policy and it's definitely one of the things where I'm looking forward to in the discussion afterwards to also uh, be learning from you and getting your perspective uh, on how you see that relationship. Um, 
The Cecilia 2050 project um, stands for choosing efficient combinations of policy instruments for low carbon development and innovation to achieve Europe's 2050 targets. And as you can tell, I didn't have to read that off my uh, sheet of paper at all. I can uh, uh, do that uh, long title by heart. What we're um, tasked with is to look at uh, the current state of um, the policies that are in place in Europe right now and see how they can be made fit for the longer term. And we are doing that together with a, a set of partners all across Europe. We are 10 in total from eight different countries. We have a good geographical spread in terms of the different uh, EU member states, but we also have a good spread in terms of the expertise that the respective partners bring along. A number of them are experts in different types of modeling exercises. Um, others bring with them experience in, uh, for example, uh, 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 game theory workshops and other different interactions to get also uh, more individual perspective to be brought in. So we're using a variety of tools to tackle the problem. One of the things that I wanted to uh, make sure I clarify at the start is that um, I am not the project leader at Ecologic Institute. I have an important part to play, but there are a number of colleagues involved and the project uh, coordinator at our end is actually my dear colleague Benjamin Gerlach, um, who sent me here to represent uh, the project on his and our behalf. To give you just a little bit more of um, you know what we're looking at, and I have to uh, do that to you, and it's not in the form of you know, our internal work package structure, but to give you a sense of where we are in the process, because that uh, you know, will show you also the level at which I can have a discussion with you on. So we're, um, we're first doing a stock taking exercise, which is also, in a sense, what I'm um, going to be focusing on today. Uh, we're looking at what have we got already, and, um, and is it working? Uh, we're going to do that on a sector basis, but also on a country basis. And uh, we're going to try and assess out what the constraints are for the policies um, that, that we have at present. And from that, we're trying to char chart um, a path into the future and uh, develop scenarios for how uh, the different sectors that contribute to Europe's emissions uh, could involve and what policy influence is required for them to decarbonize. And so we're wanting to add up in the end with relatively clear policy recommendations that can be used by policymakers both at the EU level but also in the, at the national level and help empower uh, the different types of policy stakeholders to engage in the debate with some of our results um, in their in front of them and, and in their heads as a stimulus for debate for when uh, Europe needs to be taking decisions on the future of its climate policy mix over the next couple of years. Getting into the sub, so, oh yeah, this is just to indicate where we are right now, which is crucial because, uh, you know, it does mean that right now we don't have a lot of answers, but we have a good set of questions and we have a very good understanding of what the questions are that need to be asked and we are um, at a stage where we have done a good part of the initial stock taking and I'll, I'll be going into some of the lessons from that. Um, one of the things just to clarify that I don't want to be doing is um, hopefully get into a conversation over whether or not climate change is an issue or not, just so we get that out of the way. I'm not going to engage on that in my uh, presentation. Um, but I take the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that aggregates our state of knowledge on climate science and climate policy as, as they reported and as they have entered into declarations by policymakers. And I think one can tell the f that the message that comes from the IPCC that we're essentially, if we want to be avoiding certain levels of climate change and dangerous climate change often being taken as staying below an increase of two degrees globally over pre-industrial levels, that that means that we have to be reducing global emissions uh, by half by the middle of the century and that actually industrialized countries will have to be doing a lot more. 
and uh, here are the specifics on those numbers, but I'm sure you are relatively familiar with them. Let me just show you where they've entered into statements and declarations by different sets of international bodies. And the first one is a quote from the Copenhagen Accords from 2009 that um, specify that they um, recognize the need for deep cuts in global emissions on the basis of the science with a reference to the two degrees target. And G8 leaders, for example, and I believe G20 leaders as well, have on more than one occasion specified that that means achieving at least a 50% global reduction by 2050. And that developed countries or industrialized countries need to be looking at emission reductions in that time frame of 80 to 95%. Uh, this is also these two numbers, the two degree objective and the 2050 time horizon, uh, is also something that's entered into the political commitments that have been made by EU heads of state and uh, heads of government. This is uh, the quote from the first time that they actually adopted that as a formal conclusion uh, that is issued in public that uh, resembles a form of commitment from, from their end. And so to show you that this is relatively deeply anchored as an overall commitment in EU policy making and at a level where it counts. Uh, that translates, of course, into the need to essentially be reducing drastically our greenhouse gas emissions in all sectors of the economy. That is obviously, if you look at, the, these are figures from uh, an assessment done by the European Commission. Uh, if you're wanting to achieve an 80% reduction in actual domestic emissions in Europe, what does that mean for, for different types of sectors? And they took into account the cost that the that they associated with the reductions that are different in different sectors. So, but essentially all of them, even if there are differences, say, between the power sector that they're assuming will have to essentially entirely de decarbonize and, say, the agricultural sector that, that they expect to still be, um, you know, to only be reducing by about half their emissions. Nevertheless, the challenge for the economy as a whole is an essentially a transformation, in particular, of our energy systems. And so, you know, that's obviously a challenge of a formidable magnitude. And um, there are indeed, I think, globally few answers to the question how we are going to manage to achieve that. So critical questions here are, uh, and this is what I'll be pursuing in my presentation, what are the policies that can help us trigger uh, the right incentives for actors in the marketplace and I in government and other parts of society to help us get the necessary technology deployed that we already have, but to also further stimulate innovation and technology development. And how do we mobilize the necessary capital that will be required for the investments that we need to get this stuff um, on the ground? So just to very briefly then show you how um, this is translated into um, EU and German uh, target setting for energy and climate change. So there are existing targets for 2010 and 2020, and these are enshrined, at least for the EU, also in the international treaties under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and these are split, the, there's not just a CO2 or greenhouse gas target, but there are also separate targets for renewables and for energy efficiency. For 2050, there is only a greenhouse gas target at this, uh, at this moment. And so we are at a point where the debate is starting on what the targets for 2030 should be for each of these individual components and in fact whether we should be having quantitative absolute targets for all three of these areas still going forward. In Germany the, uh, the matrix is, has more numbers in it, the, the essentially same table. Uh, in 2010 in September the German government which is still the current government adopted an energy concept, energy and climate concept that included 
These figures essentially looking at 2050, the greenhouse gas target is the same but Germany has already set itself a target that is higher than the EU average for 2020. The German target for 2020 is 40%, so over the, 30, the three decades between 2020 and 2050, um, there are milestones that have been established for interim targets to be reached in, um, to get to the decarbonization in the long run. To make it part of the concept, there are specific figures and targets for those same decades also for renewables and, and, and efficiency. And those, as you can see, have also been further broken down to enable a closer monitoring of progress. So on renewables, there is a target for electrici electricity, but there's also a target for the overall share. <coughs> now, um, from the targets, I want to be moving uh, into the developments of the policies. And I'll, I'll do that as well for Europe as a whole and, and then very briefly for Germany. And I, I really mainly mean to show you that um, a lot of these policies and the thinking behind them are essentially uh, not just something that's been taking place over the last couple of years, but that has uh, a certain history and a development that comes with it. So um, I've tried to distinguish for the purposes of, uh, of communicating those different stages of development to you. I've tried to distinguish different phases in EU policy development. And I, I won't dwell on them too long, but I, I thought that this simplification would give you a better sense of, of how those have evolved. So in the 1990s, before the international uh, regime actually put forward uh, quantitative figures and targets, uh, EU climate policy already started existing as something that people refer to as a set of uh, goals and a set of policies that were being used to try and reduce emissions. Uh, but on the greenhouse gas front, there was m one significant major proposal that was a carbon and or energy tax. And essentially, that never materialized in the form that was discussed as one of the three cornerstones of EU climate policy. So while there wasn't an international agreement and a quantitative and legally binding uh, commitment by the EU, political leaders were not unable to essentially decide among themselves that this was a tool that they were wanting to take forward. They were also stimulating the deployment of renewable energy already with a program called Altenair, but that, that was largely a fun funding and research uh, and innovation program. That was not a tool yet to get a lot of uh, renewables on the ground. And then there was a major program on energy efficiency that tried to take actually uh, pages out of the US book on, on reducing energy consumption, such as um, applying uh, setting standards, uh, your energy star, for example. They were trying to do similar things and did that for a couple of appliances, but not at the same level of ambition as was already being done here. Then moving into the next phase, uh, essentially in, at the end of the 1990s, don't take the numbers and the years to be you know, sort of hard uh, lines or deadlines or, or barriers. I've, I've been having to simplify here a little bit. Uh, you can see that after conclusion of the, the Kyoto Treaty and discussion about you know, sort of what, what is, how do we get to the details, that the mode switched in the EU from, you know, are we really doing this to how are we meeting our target? And so they were um, started the European Climate Change Program and a number of concrete policy instruments actually came out of that program from the European Emissions Trading System to um, a renewable energy directive and several instruments under uh, attempts to reduce energy consumption. And so those were all geared towards the time frame of largely around 2010 to 2008 to 12, the, the Kyoto Protocol commitment period. After that, with those policies in place and being uh, actually implemented at the national level, because I'm, I'm sure, as is the case here, there is uh, obviously a time lag between the decision to do something and the legislation being adopted and then actual implementation on the ground. Um, while that was going on, an initial review was being done and uh, the focus shifted towards the post-2012 period or the period from 2013 to 2020. So how are we doing deeper reductions for 2020? And so some of the major instruments were actually already being reviewed, such as the EU emissions trading system and the renewable energy directive. And they were being strengthened with additional targets, 
and also, as you will see in my little uh, dis sort of um, case study on the emissions trading system, also in terms of the policy design. Some of the lessons were already being taken into account to approve the system as is. And the last phase, or the phase that we're in right now, is by definition relatively empty at this point because we're essentially uh, at a point where uh, there is debate on how the next phase should, what, what it should look like. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key questions is, will there be targets on all of the different areas going forward? What is the overall architecture going to look like? And what are the key instruments? Which ones are going to be strengthened? Which ones might be uh, abandoned or be replaced by something else? And so it's, it's that phase also that I'm, I mean to be talking about later. Um, uh, this is um, a, a confusing graph, but that maybe, you know, for some of you who want to be downloading the presentation later on, might just be interested in um, colleagues at ECOFIS in uh, Germany and the Netherlands have uh, made an attempt to try and visualize how different sectors of the economy are actually covered by EU uh, policy instruments. And you can see that there is considerable overlap of course, you know, as is the nature of uh, the different areas, in particular between the EU emissions trading system, the renewables, um, the, the green box, and, and attempts to reduce energy consumption because it, it tries to address similar sectors. I will only, you know, so I needed to put that up there so that you have that in the back of your heads, uh, you know, when we get to that issue again towards the end. Um, but I don't expect you all to be able to draw that, you know, uh, off the top of your heads uh, at the end as a, as a quiz or anything like that. So what's been the progress on greenhouse gas emissions in particular in the EU following all those policies being put in place? Emissions at present are 17.6% below 1990 levels. Th those are figures for... Uh, 2011 and they are not final figures that were released by the European Environment Agency in October of last year. Um, the formal data inventories always take a year and a half to be checked and, and then presented to the public so this was an initial estimate but it just goes to show that in 2011 in one of the last years of the 2008 to 12 period emissions are actually significantly lower than they were meant to be under the target so there has been significant uh, progress in reducing emissions but you can also see in the the orange line that there is a bump um, sort of towards the end of the actual emission data uh, and that bump on the towards the the bottom I, I mean uh, maybe I'm getting the terminology wrong here my apologies um, is the is a, the slump in economic activity following the economic crisis so that's um, a 2009 uh, drop and then sort of it, it picks up again in 2010 with uh, renewed economic activity but you can see that in 2011 the um, reductions start actually happening again so there is still there's an overall trend over uh, the 2000s that continues into um, this decade of emissions being reduced and there are projections as to what is going to happen with measures that are in place already and additional measures that are already in a planning stage in most member states. And those are the lines going forward, the dark green and the, the bright green one. And they show you that they do expect with existing measures for the 20% target to be almost met and with additional measures. And that doesn't mean that, you know, sort of that those are not already in the making in some member states. Those are already being processed in the legislature that with some additional manager measures, actual emissions in Europe could be below 20% by 2020. So even below the target that they've at, at present committed themselves to publicly and internationally. On renewables, very briefly, um, there has been a significant additional deployment, and this is only additional uh, uh, capacity in the electricity sector. So it isn't doesn't include the, um, the large hydropower plants that already existed in Scandinavia and Austria in particular, but only new installations since 1990. Uh, and you can see that that's sort of had a significant increase with onshore wind being the largest contributor 
uh, followed by solid biomass. <clears throat> so one, you know, so the, sh the short version of that is from most policymakers' perspectives, in principle, the policies have done what they, were, what they set out to do. Uh, European emissions are decreasing and renewable energy deployment is increasing and increasing at a pace that, that they're on a good path towards achieving the renewables target. A recent, very recent report released by the European Commission just uh, uh, at the end of March showed that there is, the ana current analysis shows that it, some additional effort is required, but um, they're on a way towards the target. In Germany, this, the situation is rather similar in that a lot of the policies, of course, that have been decided at EU level need to be translated into the national level in all EU member states. In some cases, they you know, just have to uh, take what's been decided by everybody, for everybody, and just implement it one-to-one, -one, such as is the case at least as of this year for the European Emissions Trading System. There are very few exceptions and differences between member states. On something like renewable energy, there is much more leeway and flexibility in how member states implement the policy. And the German model I will get to in, in my little case study a little later on. So, but you can see that the same three main areas are there and that a number of uh, similar instruments are in place. And I'm not going to, to dwell on this much more. We can get into specific policies if you have a particular interest. One of the important things that I need to add, of course, to um, just the sheer, you know, sort of list of policy measures that, you know, essentially just names and without further explanation don't, don't mean much uh, to you or to anybody else is that, of course, in addition to the targets on greenhouse gases and renewables and efficiency, that there was a major policy decision two years ago by the current uh, government of Chancellor Merkel, which is to re-establish a phase-out of nuclear power that had already been decided by previous government but repealed by the current one. And so that going to show with a more conservative government in place and that taking the same decision or coming to the same conclusion as a previous more uh, uh, liberal uh, and slightly more left of center government that there is now in Germany a very broad cross-party consensus on the decision to phase out nuclear power over essentially the next 10 years. And that, of course, as you um, may well know, followed uh, considerations and intense political and uh, debate across society following the events in Japan after the tsunami and the uh, problems at the nuclear plants in, in Fukushima. But I have a very complicated slide here um, that I really, I'm, I'm hesitating to even get into. I should tell you the story, and, and you can, if you're interested, look at the slide later, which is, this may seem, you know, sort of as a very sudden or rash decision to come to. Uh, you know, one year in 2020, they decide, okay, we're going to continue and expand the lifetime that a couple of the nuclear power plants have, and a year, or actually, I think it was six, six months later, they reverse that decision and make such a fundamental decision to get rid of a certain source of power. And to be able to understand that, you have to know that, as I said earlier, there was already a previous government that had uh, made a, a taken a similar decision. So there has been a deep, an intense political debate on the use of nuclear power in Germany that stems from uh, civil protests against even the construction of nuclear power plants in the 1970s. And it has been an, a controversial uh, project in German energy policy for more than 30 years. So, you know, what, what the, in the Fukushima incidents did was essentially, it was just the last drop in the bucket, essentially, that had been, you know, sort of building uh, water over a very, very long period, and that actually in certain points of uh, German po uh, policy history had already been full, if you will. Of course, there are still proponents among um, you know, certain businesses and corporations and also in some political parties that would like to still go back on that decision, but there is, uh, I can assure you, an overwhelming cross-party majority opinion that, that this is the right thing for Germany to do. <coughs> 
One of the reasons also why they're uh, you know, able to do that is that, um, as you'll see in a minute, the deployment of other and alternative forms of energy in Germany has been you know, quite rapid and significant over the last 10 years in particular. So people now have a better sense of, we can do this differently. And actually, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't ruin our economy to do things differently. We can do it. It actually has positive effects, and we're getting rid of the significant risks that we have. And we still don't have any idea where any of the nuclear waste would be going. So, you know, that just that little X course just to give you a bit of background because I I know, f you know, from debates that we've all had ourselves in Germany among you know friends and colleagues, everybody that that this is you know, sort of not a straightforward conclusion to come to maybe on, on the face of it, but that it has a long history. <coughs> so what, is a, what have these things done for German uh, greenhouse gases? What's, you know, the success of the policies? And, you know, not saying that any, that all of the changes in greenhouse gas trajectories in Germany are due to the policies that have been put in place. Don't ma get me wrong on that count. But I'm afraid that the slide itself is in German, so I, I honestly I could not find a, an, an English language equivalent, and I couldn't produce one anymore myself. But uh, so um, uh, the essential that you need to take away is the red line on the bottom is CO2 only emissions in Germany, and they have been corrected for temperature variations across years. So they are actually, the last number that we have there is 2011. If you take away the temperature correction, it is actually lower. So it looks like more has been achieved, but this is a graph that only shows correction for, uh, in 2010 to 2011, we had a warmer winter than we had this year, for example. So one of the reasons why there was less need for heating, fuels, and so lower emissions. So this is corrected in there. There is the, the middle line, the middle, the dark blue one is for GDP. Germany. So while emissions are going down, GDP has gone up, and you see again the 2008 to 9 uh, drop in economic activity and progress. And so the last one on the bottom is essentially carbon intensity of our economic activity. And, or actually, it's carbon efficiency, rather, because it's gone up. Carbon intensity has gone down. And so between 1990 and 2011, we've had a 76% improvement in carbon efficiency. So for every unit of GDP produced, we now le need you know, three quarters of a ton less than we used to in 1990. Now, most of you will know that, that historically, for some of the uh, emission reductions, in particular in the first, I would say, six or seven years of that graph in the 1990s, there is German reunification. There is also a transformation of the economic sectors in East Germany, as there was in most of uh, Eastern Europe. And you have very significant drops in emissions in e most of Eastern Europe in following the 1990s or in the beginning of the 1990s. So that is there in Germany as well. But as you can tell, the trajectory keeps going down over time and significantly so. It goes from a reduction of around 10 or 15 percent down to um, more than 20 percent uh, towards the end of the graph. <coughs> the renewables figures and the renewable success I'll get to in a minute. Very briefly, because I think that is, um, I, I thought it would be worthwhile spending a little bit more time on the EU emissions trading system because I know that that is a topic that apparently is even, you know, making it into editorials uh, uh, in the U.S. right now, which I hadn't quite anticipated uh, coming here that um, there would be such international reaction to, you know, sort of very mundane ongoings in uh, internal EU business. But uh, that's very interesting to see. Um, I'll try to be relatively uh, fast because I have a sense that most of you will know sort of the basics around it. <coughs> what is this system? In uh, you know five uh, or, or six sentences, it covers most big point sources in Europe, in particular uh, power generators over 20 megawatts, and then um, essentially every major smokestack from um, the main industrial sectors, from steel, cement, paper, etc covers around uh, 40 to 45% of emissions. Um, it 
it worked in, I'll, I'll go there straight away. Uh, it, it's, the system has been put in place in various phases. Um, they started with a pilot phase running from 2005 to 2007 because this was a very new instrument. After all, it replaced the failed tax proposal in the EU. And, uh, you know, the, the model for the system or, you know, sort of the, the whole idea that you'd let the market do the job and you just set whatever target you want to reach and then let the, the market players uh, work out where these, these reductions can be done uh, most cost effectively was, of course, taken from the SO2 trading system in the United States. So that was, you know, sort of the, the only existing, to my knowledge, um, system like that that had been used for environmental uh, control purposes before. So, you know, they were, this was not something that Europeans had any experience with. So they did a pilot phase first uh, and then went into the phase that counted with regard to the international targets. And while that was ongoing, if you remember my earlier phases, they were basically re reviewing the system. So they used the insights from the f pilot phase and the startup problems that there were and, and tried to consolidate the system and improve it in key areas uh, for the period that was started this year from 2013 onwards. And I'll just mention a couple of those. Um, and um, they sent as largely it was a centralization and harmonization effect. In the very beginning, EU member states wanted to keep control of their emissions. You know, we're not letting have anybody in Brussels decide what happens with the allowance that they were giving to our main industrial sectors. We're just doing it by ourselves. And then afterwards, everybody realized that 27 you know, different cooks didn't make for a very tasty meal. So they realized they, they essentially had to you know, just decide what rules would apply to everybody across the EU. And so that's the main and most significant design change in terms of the allocation and how things work. Um, they have centralized and harmonized their rules. They've also done away largely with free allocation. There are still most industrial sectors that get some of the allowances in the system for free, but the ov this, this will be phased out over time and there's going to be auctioning, so no free allocation in, in the long run. And the power sector, which makes up a large chunk of the entities covered by the system, is already not receiving, except for a few national uh, exceptions, namely Poland and others, is not giving, getting any free allowances anymore. So the thing that everybody's focusing on right now, of course, and which, you know, rightly so, is, so what's, you know, how effective is this system? What's, what's happening with the price? And the price has become, uh, you know, the single uh, indicator that people are currently referring to, to judge, you know, sort of whether the system is any good or not. Uh, and, you know, so very briefly, this is again a rather confusing slide and you won't be able to read all the little sort of markers from way in the back there, but uh, maybe you get a chance to look at it in more detail in the end. It's just the main thing you need to take away from it. Um, we have an initial phase here which had particularly high uh, prices that was, you know, when nobody knew how the system worked and, you know, the uh, operators of the, the plants weren't familiar with the whole trading business and so everybody was holding on to things and the few that wanted to actually buy on the market were having to pay, pay premium prices. So, um, you know, towards the end of that phase, people realized that, you know, there were too many allowances in the markets and the price collapsed, in the, uh, collapsed at the end of the first phase. After that, we basically, uh, you know, having a system that started running relatively well and that's basically sort of from here onwards is 2008 starts somewhere over there um, and the system was working as intended and what happened the uh, uh, global economic crisis hit and so as you have seen in the emission trajectories in for Germany and for the EU there was a drop in economic activity a drop in emissions and so uh, these were largely in fact in the sectors that were covered under the system so all of a sudden, what, what was meant to be a system that was actually putting a you know, tough restriction on absolute emissions was a system that set, um, uh, that where most operators didn't actually need any additional allowances anymore. So the price went down already. Uh, and then in 2011, essentially, um, people realized that there was much more surplus in the system that uh, they had anticipated, and so the price has gone down further since. So 
um, the vote last week on a so-called backloading proposal was an attempt to you know, deal with the situation and create some additional artificial scarcity by essentially at the beginning of uh, this third trading period that started this year to be taking allowances out of the system and you know, inject them at a later stage. So you know, take away some of the, the goods to play with and therefore, you know, have everybody wanting more and driving the price up. Um, why is that important? On the one hand, one can make an argument, the fact that the price has gone down just means reductions have been made and the target's been met and the system works and everything's fine. And that is actually, you know, one of the truth of the fact that the, the, uh, that the price has gone down. It goes to show that there are no additional reductions required. Now, of course, the reasons for those, and I have an extra slide on that, the reasons for why there is a surplus in the, in the system right now are manifold. The crisis is one. It's the second block uh, from the left. But there are other factors coming into it. One of them, actually a significant one, is the fact that uh, the system allows for credits from outside the EU, in particular from projects in developing countries, to be counted towards the emission reduction obligations. So. That, according to analysis by uh, colleagues of ours from uh, the Öko Institute, not to be confused with the Ecologic Institute, although some people obviously do, is that, uh, that these additional external credits have, have been allowed into the system. So why is the low price a problem? Uh, the low price is a problem because we're essentially losing the signal that it was meant to be for companies that it was worthwhile to invest in cleaner technology and the reductions and improvements in their operations in the long term. And, and that was a crucial element in the design of the system. That was one of the you know, twin objectives. Reduce emissions beneath the, the cap or at the cap level as being set, but also get a price signal into the system will, will help you deliver longer term reductions. And that we are missing. Now, I would make the argument, though, <coughs> that that can still be fixed. So we can get into, as part of our uh, discussion, we can get into a conversation as to, you know, to what extent is this the end of emissions trading as we know it, or as in, in Europe, and, uh, you know, what does that actually mean for EU climate policy? My takeaway at this point is that the system still actually shows to be working. It has been improved significantly over time in terms of its policies, and so the pioneering that was being done here, the, the charting new territory on emission uh, regulation policies is absolutely worthwhile. And um, the policy learning that's built into EU uh, decision making with reviews and checking what adjustments might be necessary and then being able to make those adjustments has, has worked. Right now, the situation is, you know, sort of relatively politically loaded and takes back uh, place in a context where, uh, you know, climate change doesn't isn't high on on everybody's priority list, and we're still in the aftermath of the economic crisis. And there's the whole euro crisis going on, and that has everybody scared to commit to, uh, you know, major steps in 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 policy commitments. I have a sense that I, I need to be speeding up uh, um, slightly. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about was the, the German renewable energy feed-in tariff system as just another example of a policy that actually does work on uh, maybe on a level that is uh, you know, sort of more positive even at, 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 at present, even if, are there, if there are debates around it at the national level, and more positive than the debates around the EU emissions trading system. <coughs> I. Uh, I will try to keep that very brief and I can come back to specifics afterwards. So the, the main thing you need to know is this is a system, I'm, I'm sure there are actually, there are feed-in tariff uh, systems in some states in the US, uh, um, so you know, most of you will be familiar with the concepts. There are guaranteed premium tariffs and there is guarantees access to the grid and priority transmission for anybody who gets a permit to put renewable energy generation capacity in place. The costs are being shared between consumers. There's basically in all, of, all of the costs that are going into paying for that premium. And the premium is, uh, is often based on the difference between, or the, the money that's required for the states 
to pay is the difference between the actual market electricity price and the premium tariffs that are guaranteed here. If the market were paying those prices or by paying even more the guaranteed tariffs, then there wouldn't be a gap for, the, for, for anybody to fill. But the gap between market price and the tariffs is what you have as a cost. And that total cost is being taken and distributed among private households and, and small and medium enterprises. Um, just to show you very briefly, these are the figures for the different sectors in which renewable energy is being deployed in Europe, uh, in Germany. It has gone, for example, in the electricity sector up from 5% to 20% as of a uh, year before last. And uh, it's going to be 21 or 21.5 or something for uh, 2012. Uh, the final figures I'm, I'm not aware of if they're already available. Um, we have a particular controversy right now is, is on the, the speed with which that has happened, the adaptability of the system as a whole. And this is, these are just the um, annual capacity deployment figures for PV. You can tell 2008 to 2009, the figures double. 2009 to 2010, figures double again, and then they stay at a very high level 2010, 11, and 12. Why, why is that? Because the, essentially the technology development and the drop in the, the cost for the systems was faster than the adjustments being made for the, t for the tariffs. So essentially the tariffs were paying more than the technology actually required at that stage. Um, which goes to show that that, to my mind, is it. Of course, it creates a bit of a problem because you're having this additional capacity being stall installed at a rate that starts to put a strain on the the transmission infrastructure, and you may be p paying people more than they need, which you know sort of also there's something wrong with. But what it does show is, it's been a really steep curve for you know PV prices, in part thanks to uh, the deployment and the economies of scale that have been created through. Uh, the technology actually being supported through the system. So it's something that's come with the success of the mechanism and the innovation that has come with it. Now, um, I, 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 I'll try to skip a few things just to show you that you know, there, there is a debate around prices. I can get into that later in terms of some of the things that are people now criticizing. So this is, you know, the whole thing is happening so fast and the money that we're having to pay and the private households have to pay is growing so large, you know, sort of, you know, we need to find, you know, a social, socially um, adequate uh, distribution of, of the money. And, and there, of course, people want to say, you know, so we've got to stop this whole nonsense business of, of paying for clean energy, um, you know, because it's becoming too expensive. But, you know, so there is that debate and, and one can make different arguments around that. But there is also um, the need to do, uh, to look at more detail at the an infrastructure that actually has to deal with a system that's very different from what uh, electricity production in Germany looked like beforehand. You know, in the industrial powerhouses were being built where coal reserves were in Germany because that's where you would b build the coal plants. And so that's where you, where you would build your industrial plants as well. Now you have a, a much more uh, decentralized production of renewable electricity. And so you, know, you don't have the grids in the same place and you don't have the main consumers in the places where the electricity is being produced. So this is just the example for um, sort of eastern parts of Germany. Um, the rough figures at the bottom show you is roughly one third of the area of the territory. It has around a quarter of the inhabitants and only 20% of total consumption. But what is in the graph here at the bottom that in 2010, just for wind power, it produced 40% of wind, power, wind electricity. Uh, in Germany, but having only sort of 20% of the consumption. So a lot of that power needs to go to other places. And so even within Germany, there are issues with uh, you know, having to invest in the grid infrastructure now so that you can cope with that, all that additional uh, capacity being put in place. <coughs> so I've already highlighted what the main issues are. The general perception in Germany is still very positive about the system as such. Um, there are issues right now where a reform needs to look at how to deal with the constraints that come through the success of the system. 
and, and that's the challenge going forward. So I would think, you know, as part of the stock taking that informs the forward looking perspective, um, we are at a stage now where there's been proof of concept that a lot of these things can be done. They all come with problems. They create problems that you only realize uh, exist as you go along. In some cases, of course, it's easy to say with hindsight, you know, should have known better. That was obvious. You know, you, you, you had it coming. But uh, in a number of cases, even if there were instances where that was true, the political circumstances and the awareness among the political and economic players that are involved takes time to grow and, and, and then result in their thinking changing and realizing that things need to be done differently. So there are learning processes also among the decision makers in many levels involved that, that you cannot force upon them even if you know, there are people who would know better um, at the point at which the decisions are being taken. Um, but one of the key challenges right now, I think, if we're looking at the decarbonization going forward, is that a lot of these policies were for, you know, what would you call it, the initial 20%, the initial 25% 25% of emissions reductions and getting the renewable technology out. But, you know, so in a sense, those were incremental steps. And now we're looking at, we're getting to a different order of magnitude and we're looking at different challenges. And, you know, it becomes more transformative at this point in time. And so that poses new questions for how we design policies and what mechanisms are being built in to cope with the, you know, dealing with the unexpected, you know, sort of the, they were essentially the uh, well-known, you know, Rumsfeldian unknowns, unknowns in the system that one needs to kind of pre prepare for as well. <coughs> I will click through a number of these and essentially just go into um, key questions that are being asked at European level for the future development right now. You know, one of the key questions is, should we essentially just you know, have one big system for everything? Are we changing the architecture as a whole, uh, you know, such as the EU ETS? How do we deal with the fact that there are all these you know, small overlapping points and, and the different tools? how much of that kind of overlap and redundancy on the one hand looking at it negatively can we even afford but looking at it positively do we need to make sure that we don't just have one shot and if we miss it you know we don't get to where we need to mm. what is in fact the role of pricing instruments as a whole you know do we is is that the best way going forward you know and if the EU ETS doesn't cut it do we need to come back and and you know adopt a tax instead you know, notwithstanding the fact that that would likely not, you know, have a lot of chances of being adopted. But, you know, in terms of the academic exercise of thinking about the optimal instruments, is it pricing? Is it carbon pricing? Or are there other types of instruments that we should be looking at instead? Do you, do you specifically go at greenhouse gas emission reductions or do you just target renewables and energy efficiency or the other way around? Um, the European Commission has put forward a what they call a green paper, which is essentially a discussion document trying to open that conversation at the political level and with uh, the relevant ministers. And they published it at the end of March. And a lot of those types of questions are in there and are going to be shaping the, the debates among the interested circles. Politically, <coughs> uh, things have not been all that rosy. Uh, EU climate policy is in a bit of a holding pattern overall and to my mind the vote last week in the European Parliament on emissions trading is just another symptom of that. There is, you know, sort of the, the forward movement has been stalled, let's put it that way. Uh, and one of the reasons is that the potential champions like uh, Germany here, Chancellor Merkel or the UK with uh, Prime Minister David Cameron are you know, somewhat more reluctant and they don't have the big following that they, they had uh, a couple of years ago, say in 2007 and 2008, when you know, the, the post-2012 period was being decided in terms of targets and, and instruments. So, um, and, and we have a, a, a stalwart defender in Brussels with uh, Connie Hedegaard on the right-hand side, a commissioner for climate action. But the environment minister from Poland, uh, Mr. Koroletz, you know, being the one who says, uh, you know, not, you know, no going forward beyond where we are right now, you know, if I have anything to say about it. 
So, you know, that in short is what been, what's been happening the last two years, and that's still where we are right now. And so the big question is on the political side, are there ways in one can envisage this situation changing? And I think there is. In, in, in Germany, for example, we'll have elections in September, and it might be a slightly different government uh, coming out of that. And uh, a, a possibly re-elected uh, chancellor might choose to actually make that an issue again that she you know, puts on the agenda uh, with her colleagues in Brussels. Uh, and there have been changes in governments in the EU that ha have actually already meant that there, there is a shift towards more progressive policy coming again. And then there is a driver which is, I think, do I have that in here? No. Uh, the international negotiations under the United Nations they have set themselves, uh, and that's agreed by everybody, including you know, the EU and the US, set themselves a timeline towards 2015 for a new uh, kind of a agreement to be negotiated. And so that is there as the milestone or the flag in the timeline that everybody needs to be looking at also the European Union. So you know, there is a need to actually be coming up. There's international pressure to be doing homework and coming up with figures for, for a future target in the EU. And so that as the, that negotiation process moves forward, that is also going to be influencing um, in, uh, um, even, I think, our, our Polish uh, uh, colleagues. Because ministers like Mr. Korolec will be participating in these negotiations and will be facing questions also from non-EU colleagues on the, on the matter. Um, the part where actually you have more to, s I, I really want to hear more from you than you more from me, but since I've been going vastly over time, is, you know, what is the, the role of the, the U.S. In, in all of this, in, in the current situation? And I'm, I only have a few points from what I perceive to be a, a European perspective on that. And one is, of course, since I just mentioned the United Nations uh, and the negotiations, uh, going to 2015 is what role is the U.S. going to play in the further development of the regime? You know, most of you will remember or will be aware of um, the way things went 15 years ago uh, with the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol uh, that, you know, had U.S. signature or agreement at the conference, but that could never be put uh, towards the um, uh, Senate and the House for ratification because there was not enough support for the U.S. committing to be part of the treaty. So it never became uh, a party to the international treaty that it had helped negotiate and that it had also influenced and shaped in key provisions in that treaty. Uh, I think we wouldn't have, on the positive side, we wouldn't have had a compliance system that we had without sub U.S. support you know, maybe it would have been stronger on some of the um, provisions on forced accounting, whatever. That's all beside the point. The U.S. were part of the negotiations, but then couldn't join because of the domestic political constraints. So everybody in Europe's been, you know, following uh, what's been happening on the various attempts to introduce uh, federal legislation on uh, climate change and also has seen what's hap been happening at the state level. Uh, in you know sort of the in the different areas, be that uh, you know the Reggie system or AB 32 uh, in California, and you know we know how hard it is for this to be discussed uh, at the Washington level. So you you know I'm I'm now I'm I feel like I'm addressing the collective you, but that's you know sort of don't take that personal by uh, any means. <laughs> Um, Europeans are aware, I think, of the domestic political constraints. And so the big question is, you know, how can one come to an understanding of how to accommodate the constraints and get a maximum input from the U.S. as a, as a contribution to the international effort, but at the same time not have the whole system be held hostage by that being the minimal or the, the the common, the lowest common denominator that everybody else can agree to. I think that is, that is the key challenge here, and that is 
Um, you know, so that's a question that, that Europeans have, knowing fairly well that they have right now very much their own domestic constraints and, and political battles to deal with. So this is, you know, sort of, um, that's, that's that fully taken into account. So that's, that's a key question here. And then, of course, you know, talk of the town here is uh, the, the boom in, uh, in additional natural gas e extraction and what that has done to U.S. emissions and what it does to energy independence, imports, export, etc. And that's you know, uh, a development that's being watched with a lot of interest um, on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, with more worries when it comes to unconventional oils, in particular, sort of from north of uh, you know your borders, uh, but you know more on a um, big interest also with regard to uh, additional access to to natural gas, potentially even for Europe. You know, uh, what about uh, exporting some of that clean fuel? Uh, you know, to help us uh, out. That I'm sure a number of energy analysts are actually um, you know looking at very closely. What are the, the developments in, in the infrastructure? In the Netherlands, in the UK, there are already uh, agreements with the US. There are new terminals for LNG being built. So, you know, so that, will that will play into the energy mix in Europe as well, as are potentially, if, if you're using all of that yourselves, you know, additional exports maybe of uh, US coal, et cetera. So that's, you know, I think that's still at play right now. There are certain developments uh, or trends that, that one can see. but. Um, is one where I think Europeans are interested in, you know, engaging with uh, U.S. stakeholders on wh what those developments in the U.S. mean for other parts of the world. Um, and at the same time, we're, we were only, you know, we're just talking about additional fossil fuels, and of course, um, you know, there's there's a question as to over the life cycle how much cleaner. Um, um, the new gas is extraction is going to be, but you know, looking back at the figures that we had on, in particular, photovoltaic capacity installments in Germany, this is the graph for installations uh, globally from 2000. I think this is a, a this is cumulative installed power in in megawatts, and you know, sort of oddly enough, a small country like Germany actually sort of seems to be taking up a half of that. And um, you know, if you compare that um, with with what's been installed in California, for example, I know it's not the Sunshine State, but you know, still pretty warm compared uh, to to other parts of the world. Uh, there is significant uh, that is that is significantly less. And while I'm aware that there are differences in prices for the modules, etc., you know, those have come down, as we all know. And I thought this was an extremely Illustrative graph uh, done by your uh, um, uh, by NREL that shows what the the solar resources are actually in the United States and compare that with Spain and Germany. And you know most of you will know what media story that refers to and why it is those two countries, etc. But I, I'm not going to go into that. It's just it seemed to me to be very instructive to see how in terms of resources, just the energy arriving on the ground, you have such better conditions than, you know, sort of most parts uh, of Europe. And so that just, you know, to me that shows enormous potential for using photovoltaics to cover your electricity needs. Um, third and, uh, or fourth and last point on, you know, EU and, and US relations, the engagement with the major, the, the major em emerging economies is something that I think is an interest in both overall economic terms, but uh, also geopolitical, but certainly also from an energy and climate perspective. And my personal sense is that there are a lot of activities and different types of partnerships and, 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 and deals on the side um, between a number of European member states, and they don't always get that coordinated very well. And for example, uh, the US. And so I think an exchange on, you know, how to best engage these countries that are growing rapidly, that are also uh, in have significant increases in their energy needs, and how that can be done in a way that is still sustainable and happens and, and helps move the world as a whole towards a low carbon pathway, I think is something that 
we best don't think uh, about just by ourselves, but uh, in dialogue. <clears throat> With that, I'll, I'll conclude, and I really want to and look forward to your comments and, and your insights on the, the topics that I've raised, and I'm not going to go through my, my summary here. Thank you very much for your attention. Absolutely. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start right there. Hi, it's good to see you. You said that um, in hindsight there were mistakes in the system or the design of the system that should have been obvious. <coughs> uh, in hindsight, how would you have designed the system differently to avoid the uh, glut of allowances that occurred when they found the Yeah. Um, do you have recommendations? Should we rather sort of take a couple and then... Sure, go ahead. We're just going to go down the floor uh, here. My question follows up the issue of the U.S. stance mm -hmm. on, um, on climate change, but it also ties into the... the um, the global picture a bit. Um, with the, the decarbonization, there's somewhat of a deindustrialization of Europe that appears to be happening where a lot of the industry is moving to China and they're producing just as dirty of, of electricity as as the worst of times in the West. Um, and I'm curious how that might be accounted for. Mm. And I think from the American perspective, that is the big problem is that we don't include China and India in any of the discussion and yet we need to because we don't think about um, their contribution and it's growing tremendously with an amazing amount of coal and uh, I'm just curious about um, how you would address that. Thanks. And I have just an expansion of that which is the chart that projects a 30% decrease in um, CO2 emissions mm -hmm. uh, by 2030. What were the economic assumptions underlying that? Mm -hmm. Um, may, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take those and uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into the additional questions afterwards. <coughs> to start with, uh, what were the obvious mistakes um, from my perspective done in the design of the emissions trading system? So to start with, uh, you know, sort of I was at the, you know, uh, to be transparent about it, I was on the political advocate side of uh, that, on, on, the, on the greed side of things as the original emissions trading directive was being uh, decided on and I, I still believe to be true what you know sort of the uh, environmental groups were advocating back then which is uh, you should you could have from the start actually done a much better job with the allocation the whole sort of harmonization and centralization and just be simple about it don't draw up you know uh, long lists of different uh, product specific benchmarks but just go with uh, with auctioning as the clean and economically you know sensible way of distributing the allowances that that was a key recommendation I think that was a mistake that was only sort of rectified a little later that might have of course in and by itself not done anything about the uh, the price problem uh, Another key thing um, that I, I think could have been done significantly better that also there was a lot of uh, you know, advocacy for uh, back then was to limit the access to international offsets. And, and for an, a variety of reasons. I mean, we now see that in terms of the, the quantity of it, that, that is an actual problem. And if I do recall correctly, and I haven't been updated myself on that uh, recently, um, some of these design uh, elements in that were being thought of or even potentially implemented for Reggie, for example, had triggers for uh, you know when you would actually only be allowed to get additional access to offsets. That you know sort of a, s a solution like that that would actually only um, allow that as a safety valve to hedge against prices that would be too high. Uh, that could have that could have been a solution that could have been chosen for the EU system as well, you know, because you you don't necessarily have to have zero, you know, but you can you can do it in doses and in a more measured way. 
And in the same way, I believe, and that's, you know, sort of maybe wasn't all that obvious, but that could be a possible solution going forward is that what was now being debated, taking extra allowances out of the system, that could be just an automatic um, mechanism that essentially works in the same way as that release of additional uh, access to credits. And those additional uh, credits don't have to be coming from outside of a given system. They could be coming from inside. And you could have the, re you know, the reverse option, which was an automatic withdrawal of allowances too. And I, I admit that I think not many people were thinking about that. So that you know, sort of would be a bit, a little bit hard to claim that that's actually something that you know people had recommended. Although there had been talks about you know triggers on both ends and price bans, etc. All that had been part of the conversation, but they chose to go with a cleaner, let's not regulate the market too much approach, and that seems to not have worked out well enough. On the first of all, the, econo the economics. I'm afraid I, I would have to come back to you on that because I'll have to look up the specifics uh, um, in the assumptions in the underlying uh, documentation of the, the working documents that are available publicly by the European Commission. So <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll look into that for you. The, um, uh, the graph that I showed that had these two lines with existing with additional measures, it is based on input that comes from the member states themselves. So they submit by themselves their assessment of what these uh, measures are going to deliver and so you know they they hand them to the the European Environment Agency and that processes them so you actually have to take them with a grain of salt uh, we have uh, done a very recent or in the process still of uh, carrying out a project for DG climate action that assesses what governments what the national uh, climate change plans actually can deliver and um, from that experience, although that's not sort of a published work yet, and it sort of was a rudimentary analysis, wasn't sort of very detailed, and, and not a quantitative analysis, was showing that there are gaps in the implementation of what's been promised compared to what is happening. But there are also uh, several instances where they're further advanced, where, as I said, measures that were only said to be, you know, to be happening sometime in the future are actually already coming online. So. I, on on the whole, uh, you know, take it with uh, even if you take it with a 50% discount, you are far below the 20% target for 2020 uh, already. On the deindustrialization, um, I'm <coughs> not entirely sure that I share sort of the picture that you paint, or maybe uh, it is tr true in different ways for different sectors, because in uh, a number a number of cases where I've had conversations with uh, industrial sector representatives <coughs> say in the steel sector and cement the plants that they put up in other parts of the world are cleaner and more efficient than the plants that they have operating in Europe so you know you're right about the, of course about the power that they need you know so there's the additional power and, and if then you know sort of this is an ineffective uh, coal plant then you know you have the the emissions right there you might not have them in the plant uh, I itself um, but I think there <coughs> one has to look at this sort of on a sector by sector basis on the specific instances to see to what extent is it actually true that emissions are essentially moving. And uh, also, w at least when it comes to industrial sectors, I've seen a number of cases where just the, there isn't a deindustrialization in the sense that the production capacity actually leaves Europe necessarily. It happens in sectors like aluminium that is so strongly dependent on indeed on the price of electricity. And that also has less issues in sort of you know overall mobility of the goods that they produce. But for a couple of other sectors, um, you know, there, it's not like uh, steel plants are being closed left or right, or cement plants in Europe. Um, it, there is there are very well, specific. Like consumer goods, though, that's all been sure. Okay, sorry that, that I didn't cover under under industrialization. That's maybe my my mistake okay. in in misunderstanding the the question. Um, on on that on those fronts, so. Um, my sense is that there is an increasing awareness in, uh, in particular in China, it's like the largest, single largest place of production of goods like that that are being, being shipped around the world, that it doesn't want to be seen as, uh, you know, sort of the, the dirty, uh, um, you know, sort of we are only the guys who produce in, in a dirty fashion for the rest of the world. But there is, an, on the one hand, there are 
actual economics of the, the problems that are being created through the pollution, but that there is also an awareness of we might actually be putting, uh, you know, sort of carbon-based uh, um, export tariffs on our stuff to try and, and re regulate these things. So my sense is, you know, sort of there is there is movement in the right direction. This isn't isn't happening sort of an uncontrolled level, and this is not something that actually sort of enters very strongly into the debate uh, at the EU level. Only in the lines of arguments about carbon leakage and to what extent is it happening and if it's happening to what extent is it carbon regulation induced or just happening because there are uh, production capacity is just being built in other parts of the world because that's where say the steel is being needed that you know sorry if that wasn't sort of entirely satisfying answer with this uh, sort of the reflects I think the the level and the focus of the debate that we're having in, in Europe on the issue so I have one, two, three, and you will just have to come in. I can't see everybody properly. And you know, please go ahead, sir. Uh, this question relates more to, to Germany uh, and German climate targets. I'm wondering if they have are still being kind of maintained in, despite the withdrawal of nuclear power mm -hmm. and the whole energy and discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or is there a recognition that, that, that you know? Um, yeah, you, you mentioned in your talk that Europe's looking at a lot of various options for the future, including shrinking or growing the EU ETS, but given that it's now going to be linking to the uh, Australian trading system and mm -hmm. so forth, does that, and of course they're potentially linked to other trading systems, does that somewhat limit Europe's options or does it actually open up more opportunities in your opinion mm -hmm. for, for what they can do in the future? That's a very good question. Uh, I would like to address the question of where the U.S. is going in their negotiations. I don't think they're going any further in these than on any other negotiations that we've been having at the national level. But if you come to a meeting on Thursday in New York held by the New York Times, it's all about sustainable cities. And that's where the action will be mm -hmm. in the U.S. I don't think we can hope for much more right now. <coughs> Thank you. But just to kind of echo off the previous two comments and to riff on the concept of linking, I think the only thing that would prevent, well, I think the top, I have a lot less faith in the top-down world. I think it'll be less relevant. So I think we're in a bottom-up world where individual programs will link together. And I think uh, the only thing that would prevent these US programs from linking with the European program uh, is, or maybe, the biggest factor that would prevent linking is that the EU does not have a price floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was really interested to hear that you kind of mentioned price floor is an option to fix scarcity fourth or fifth. And you mentioned uh, that you don't really want to mess with the market that much, but I mean backloading allowances is messing with the market. So I just, I guess I, I don't really buy that. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on why EU policymakers are really reticent to discuss the price floor. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On the, the German climate targets, um, the very simple and straightforward answer is yes, they are being maintained. And they have been sort of reaffirmed in the government decisions on the nuclear phase out. They essentially reaffirmed at the same time that uh, all of the targets would be adhered to. Um, my personal sense is that, uh, you know, with the success in in renewable power up until 2020, at least, sort of the nuclear phase out isn't actually sort of the biggest detriment here, or sort of isn't isn't a major obstacle. The much larger problem is actually the uh, lack in strengthening of the cap of the EU ETS, because essentially, <coughs> German decision makers don't have regulatory control over you know half of the of the country's emissions because those are being you know not that they've you know they they've given it away you know sort of willingly so <laughs> this is it's no it's not just although that often happens is the pointing at Brussels you know sort of the guys in the gray suits they're deciding over our emissions it's not that it's uh, <coughs> it's just that the sheer the design of the system is such 
that you essentially take the power sector and main industrial sectors out of the equation and you have then literally the non-ETS sector that you then try to address your additional policies to. And if the, the German 40% target um, by 2020 is going to be very hard to achieve um, without additional reductions also happening in the power sector and, and in the industrial sectors. And the ETS is not looking likely to be you know, helping with that at all. So the, the only thing that we actually have in terms of um, hoping that there will be reductions coming from, that, from those sectors as well is in fact the other non-greenhouse gas uh, instruments. So the fact that the, the renewable energy deployment continues, that the legislation on energy savings is uh, being implemented means hopefully that there will be reductions in the ETS sector that are not triggered and incentivized by the emissions trading system itself. Um, but there are shadows of doubt over you know, what the plan will look like for Germany to reach its 40% target if the ETS cannot um, contribute to it uh, any further. And, and that's a debate that, that is something on a rational level that also you know, sort of convinces those even in, uh, sort of in, the, in the current government that care about these targets and want to achieve them, that you know, sort of resonates with them. If Europe doesn't move, you know, we will have a hard time actually meeting our own target. Um, but right now, sort of that, you know, sort of in and by itself doesn't isn't a strong enough argument to to win people over to have uh, Germany as a whole be more fervent a supporter of ETS reform. Because essentially, unfortunately, the government has been hasn't been able to be too outspoken on 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 strengthening the ETS because of fights between the economics minister and the environment minister on the issue. <coughs> yeah. The linking. Um, let's look first at the, the you know the constraints. So, or you know, is this a constraint or an option? Indeed, I think with the price floor, you put your your you know finger to the most crucial question. I'm personally, of course, at this point, hoping that that conversation will help uh, bring the debate in Europe forward on the need to put you know some form of price control mechanism into the system. I would personally much more. You know, m be more in favor of actually having you know sort of certain automatic mechanisms kicking in, um, and uh, you know scarce scarcity being increased or, or or decreased through you know sort of more foreseeable and predictable measures rather than having what ha what's happening now or what's potentially not happening now, which is uh, to have more ad hoc intervention happen. So we really. We need to find mechanisms that are non-disruptive means of intervening in the market when it, it needs, when it requires uh, intervention. And I'm, sh I'm sure that the conversations between uh, Australian uh, policymakers or regulators and uh, the European ones have uh, become more difficult, <laughs> especially um, um, since last week. There was actually a, a conference with Australian participation on the global carbon market uh, developments in Berlin only 10 days ago, at which they were able to exchange um, views on that. And that was, that was, of course, before the parliament vote. And so <coughs> you know, this was still everybody keeping their fingers crossed that uh, it will be a different world a few days later. Um, I, I think at the same time, the size of the markets is such that the Australian system you know, it it would it, it it will essentially be determined largely by what's happening in the European system. You know, so it's just so much smaller. Um, I believe, and and do correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the same is actually true to some extent with uh, uh, with the Western Climate Initiative in terms of the emissions covered. But I could be wrong there. That it compared to what's like the just volume that's regulated under the EU ETS, that it's uh, sort of a much smaller overall size. So, <coughs> you know, that may mean that to some extent, uh, if there were linking, you yeah, know, the, the large market will, would still determine to a large extent what happens overall. But I would definitely uh, be in favor of those that are having conversations with European uh, decision makers on the options for linking to insist on improvements to the current system. <coughs> 
Having said which, I think there are things like, uh, you know, the rules on, um, you know, what types of offsets can be used in the Australian system that I would hope to be rectified also from, you know, in terms of preserving the best of uh, the many different carbon market worlds that are out there. Um, under the EU ETS, can a member country impose limitations, say, on the power sector that are stricter than the ETS mm. system? Right? Because in American environmental law, um, national laws apply to all the states, but in most cases the states have the freedom to be stricter, which is why when nothing's happening in Washington, the more liberal parts of the country can do a lot on their own. Is, is that a feature of the uh, EU ETS as well? Uh, it is a feature of the EU as a whole, but it, it's not of the ETS as such. So it is, it's, since the all the rules for you know, how many allowances does a steel plant get do not differ anymore between a steel plant in the UK and in, in Germany. It's hard to do something in the national level in terms of the allocation and you cannot influence the overall cap. What you can do is, and, and the UK did this, although it's sort of currently, I think, under, um, under attack at present, the UK actually tried to introduce a floor price just for, you know, companies involved in the system in the UK. It's hard to do, though. I think it's uh, you know sort of it, it can be done, but especially if you're just having to you know go it alone and not even be able to point to say these two, three other countries on the continent that are doing as we do, uh, that is very difficult. So um, one of the possible developments, very much right now, is that uh, some countries do get together and decide that they are going to coordinate on measures to complement what's happening under the EU ETS and, and be that sort of stricter uh, emission regulation at the national level or um, you know additional taxation for example you know to supplement that all of these things are possible but I am not privy to conversations that may be happening between say the UK, Germany, France, Sweden for example which are kind of the core group or and Denmark the core group of those that are are more progressive on the issue uh, to know whether that's already devan advancing. And, and in, as you heard from the example that I gave about the controversy at, even within the German government between the environment and the economics minister, these, you know, even if there's overall support or environment minister may be supportive of strengthening the system, there are debates and controversies uh, in many of these countries. So actually getting national legislation through that goes beyond what's being done across the EU is still a hard political fight. Uh, with ISIS, there's another uh, kind of linkage that I, I'm thinking about, which is not the, so much of the linkage between the uh, the trading systems as the linkage at the national level, getting back to uh, an attempt at some kind of a, of a meaningful international agreement, uh, possibly something that would replace the Kyoto Protocol. It appears to me that the U.S. is going in a very different direction. Even though we do have two groups of states, or one big state and a group of states that are going forward with uh, cap and trade, most of the country is not. And there, I would have to say that overall, nationally, uh, there's a tremendous amount of resistance mm. to cap and trade, so much so that, that Obama uh, is indeed interested in trying to revive it. There is some nominal interest in carbon tax, but I think most people that really think about these mm. things don't believe that we're going to get anything significant in that group either. Mm. What is happening, uh, although it's not happening on exactly the schedule that we had anticipated, are performance standards for our power plants. No. And uh, right now what is uh, supposed to be happening is we're supposed to be getting new 
uh, performance standards for uh, new power plants uh, followed quickly by performance standards for existing power plants. Uh, now, the EPA hasn't quite said as much, but that really seems to be, I mean, they have said as much for new plants, they haven't tipped their hand yet for existing plants, but that seems to be the logical direction. And there we're talking about 40% or so of our emissions. The, one of the, I think, most salient factors with a performance standard is that it doesn't have the effect on prices that a carbon tax or cap and trade has. By prices, I mean prices to manufacturers that then get passed on to consumers, unless, of course, the balances are, are allocated. I'm starting to be long-winded about this, but mm, my not done. point is that it puts the U.S. significantly out of sync with the EU because of this price issue. If it turns out that the EU continues with a mechanism that has a profound effect on consumer prices, if it's working, I know that's not happening now, but if allowances had a price, real meaningful price, then that should be reflected in consumer prices. Mm. Performance standards don't do that. There's no transfer of money to the government, uh, which keeps the price effect much lower. Mm. I really wonder how that's going to be resolved. Because I don't think the U.S. is going to get told by the EU into something equivalent to cap and trade that will affect our prices in the same way. And I'm wondering whether the EU is thinking about the possibility that they may have to make a major redesign to put themselves in balance with the, what the U.S. is likely to do or find they have this big price differential that's harmful to mm. EU manufacturing. Mm. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, I'll, 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 uh, we, should, we should spend more time on that, and I, I will. Uh, there's another hand over there. And do contribute to uh, to the question. If I just want to say, I think the overall um, elephant in the room is that all the developed countries have a green party. And I think this has made a great big difference in Germany because you had a foreign minister from the green party, I mean, someone at a high political level. We do not have that in the United States, and we should be thinking about forming not only a Green Party, there are little elements, but a major Green Party. The Republican Party is in disarray, and it is the moment to strike. This will all, it'd be the only thing that will make a difference in the United States, that we could ever dream of reaching what you have in the EU. A three-party system, that will be a Not major a three, shake up. A two. <laughs> right. Okay. Just you just re 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 yes. <laughs> replacing right. one with the <laughs> other. <laughs> That's also worth continuing a conversation over. Um, well, these young people of the future. Mm. I work with the ones at the Earth Institute of Columbia. Mm. So, you know, the two get together and get Soros and Bloomberg. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's the money there. No. They put out money for these things. No. They are in a position to fund a mm. real major political party no. which will realize what our future is no. without it. No, I mean, major. Is politically realistic? It is, everything I mean, you, is possible if you dream. <laughs> But, but if you think about the Republican Party now, if, even if it is in disarray, the only thing it breaks into is a more conservative arm and then a group that is democratic that might break off into a, a Green Party arm, but we're, we're designed for a two-party system. I believe that there are many people in the Republican Party who believe in climate change, that they see what happens. 
they have been affected by uh, Katrina, uh, Irene, and Sandy. You know, it's no secret. So everything's there. But half of them think that it doesn't exist. Half of them say this isn't man -made. That's political. Look what happened with Romney. He started a green fund, in effect, in Massachusetts, and during what happened during his campaign. So I think there are a lot of Romneys there who know what the truth is, but they politically have not been, have found a home. And the home will be the Green Party, and it's up to you. I'm and, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that your political system can cope with the additional complexity of, of there being more than, than two key parties. I mean, interesting. Go ahead. An interesting thing that I always observed in Germany is that the Green Party also initially had a very conservative angle. So, I mean, the Green Party in Germany, what, I mean, from an outside perspective, I mean, from an American viewpoint, I mean, the Greens seem very progressive and kind of radicalized, right? But, I mean, from a German-born party, it was actually coming out of the conservative families. That's just I mean, what a I'm lot saying. of the voters were actually children and mothers who went green. They were coming from CDU voters who switched to Greens in the 80s. And so, yeah. Why should Green be not be conservative? They're affected by this uh, earth we live on as well as liberals. I mean, many yeah. Republicans voted for HR two four five four. Yeah, it, right? it was, and, don't forget it was we, Nixon we who formed EPA. And it's Bush one who signed the cap and trade bill. But to throw away, I mean, we almost passed the cap and trade bill in America. And I think one the reason I think it didn't happen is because Obama was not didn't act strongly enough, it didn't show enough leadership. That's one of the reasons. Partisanship is another reason, but that goes down on the list for me. It's number two, maybe number three. So let's not throw out the whole system. I think just next time around we need that stronger backing and we need to put more pressure on our democratic leadership to use this bully public to pass it, pass it through. We already, I mean, Republicans already voted for a cap and trade bill in the House. And some of them in the Senate were ready to vote for it too. Uh, so for a third party, I just remember Nader Bush. Third party, yeah. third okay, second. for a green. <laughs> but what okay. would you get rid of the Republicans? Yeah, like <laughs> I think they're in disarray, and it is a chance. The chance is now. Is it Democrats? I, I can so. personally definitely recommend looking at multi party systems. They're fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I had a completely unrelated question. Um, I was going to ask about um, whether there's a good system for sort of international cooperation on transmission planning in the EU, um, particularly as it regard, regards dealing with uh, increased congestion from um, sort of mobilization of renewables in, um, I guess, Germany primarily and then throughout the EU as Thanks a lot. That's a very good question. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to disappoint you because it's, it's not something that I, uh, I know an awful lot about. Um, and it's not, definitely not just a, a Germany-related uh, uh, question. Uh, there is already, I mean, the German market or electricity market, also in terms of the, the grid, is already connected and integrated. You're having to leave? Okay, Don, it's such a pleasure. Sorry, I just need to shake hands well, with this man. Know. Yes, <laughs> will do. Okay, it's I wanted to, to answer you. my question. Yes, absolutely. So I was like, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll report back. Down. Good, yes, I'm still going to get. Um, and uh, the sort of Scandinavia is organized in, in one sort of the North Pool. Um, and so there, there are these sort of more regionalized uh, connections already. But um, and you know there are other pockets of larger renewable capacities such as in in Spain, and there is planning for you know what they call trans European networks and electricity, or you know T E N dash E, super acronym. Uh, but the stage at which they are in terms of actually delivering the uh, additional investment in the infrastructure, I I'm not up to date with, uh, unfortunately. Um, another sort of big area for in, uh, investments is actually the, are the interconnectors to, you know, the offshore wind sites. And those are, you know, sort of, for example, in, in Germany seem to be running into problems, finding sort of the right investors, etc. But those are on, th those are ongoing projects. Um, but I think they're, they're tricky instances, in particular, sort of the, 
since these are still, to some extent, large extent, national grids, and um, in most cases what they need is proper interconnectors between them, and then probably st strengthening s uh, some of the national grids as well, but there isn't talk of, say, uh, you know, a super electricity highway between, you know, the Baltic Sea and its wind power and Spain and its solar power, for example. But, you know, people are thinking <coughs> about ideas like that. And in Germany, that's actually part of, it's one of the concrete ideas that they're looking at is the potential electricity highway, you know, with no exits between north and south. Uh, I, I actually, I really did want to come to, uh, to Don's point. Um, it's interesting. I'd actually sort of I'll, I'll put some of that back to you. You know, sort of is regulation, uh, is the um, performance standards for power plants, you know, sort of if you all had to pick a number, you know, sort of how likely is that happening? Uh, you know, is that anywhere? Is it more like a 10% or 80%? Uh, I think it is happening in the sense yeah. that natural gas is. Natural gas fired power plants are starting to be more of an attractive mm -hmm. alternative than mm -hmm. coal fired, and partially because of the standards that they're putting on the coal fired power plants. Mm -hmm. And of course, the price yeah. of gas is so low. Yeah. It won't stay low forever, but yeah. at the same time, it'll be low enough to compete with gas or with coal, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Several states, individual states, already have uh, performance standards mm -hmm. 1,200 pounds per megawatt hour. So that's the equivalent of a um, combined cycle natural gas turbine. You can't, uh, your fleet mm -hmm. average can't be over that emissions wise. Nice. You can have individual plants that have a higher average, but um, they fleet wide, they have to average out at that level. And that's California, and that's for Oregon, mm -hmm. Washington, um, a couple other states in the West. Are that's for new that. plants, is it? No. So you know what 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 do existing coal plants do? They're part of a larger fleet, so it's right. Okay, sorry, it's that I I didn't catch that. Okay, so it's but it's only on a state by state basis, and he was talking about federalizing this whole concept, yeah. which is what the EPA is up against. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the caveat on that is we anticipate by now that we would have the uh, standards for for new coal fired power plants. <coughs> That's been delayed, most likely because it's going to be uh, denuded. Mm -hmm. uh, because of political pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think the prospects for uh, existing plants uh, anytime soon are, are grim uh, mm -hmm. because there are, uh, there's huge potential for, uh, for litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's midterm elections and the, and the imperilment of the, the Senate majority mm -hmm. to be looked at. I, I, can't, I can't conceive of that coming down the pike in, in the next year, year or two. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's a, it's a ways off and a, kind of a frail read no. to, to rely on for no. U.S. policy. Because if we, I mean, if we were just to imagine that that was actually being federalized and that there would be a sort of a tough standard for existing plants and that would actually mean that uh, several old plants would have to be decommissioned and that essentially sort of really, you know, sort of the average uh, carbon intensity of your power production would be reduced by that way. Um, you know, I think that would that would obviously sort of be a significant achievement in terms of uh, the impact it would have on carbon emissions, and I don't think it would be at all incompatible what's, what, with what's happening elsewhere. Uh, first of all, I, I would actually think that it would have a knock-on effect uh, on prices. You know, there are costs associated with that too. So, you know, part of the argument in terms of that being it being out of sync in terms of the cost, I'm 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 not sure sort of hold. Uh, a lot of water, but I, uh, overall the idea is also being discussed and actually has been tried to sort of have inserted in other, into other legislation to have minimum uh, emission performance standards for new power plants also in Europe. In particular, they're being discussed with relation to uh, then plants that would otherwise be emitting more than the standard uh, being forced to invest into CCS technology. So as also has advocates among advocates for CCS to have those kinds of standards uh, being deployed. And I think in all likelihood that debate will you know, be strengthened, will resurface over the next uh, two or three years as part of a look at you know, what are we doing in the long run. So I had, yeah, two more. Um, something I've been hearing and observing from government side is that there's a bigger push to export coal to Europe and Germany in particular. The numbers have gone up in the last year and a half. Mm. And so, how, 
Yeah, and to China. So, um, how do you attribute that to wanting to reduce um, emissions in, in Germany or in Europe mm -hmm. if coal imports are going up? Well, first of all, you only said that coal exports from the U.S. Are, are increasing. It doesn't necessarily mean that coal consumption in Europe goes up because it may be replacing imports coming from Australia, etc. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I actually, uh, to be honest, I, I also I would have to come back to you on sort of the EU-wide figures for how uh, the coal burn is or coal imports are are developing. Uh, they may um, sort of right now be increasing because actually sort of gas in Europe is more expensive. So we, you know, that's. But the big driver is not necessarily, I think, the availability in the U.S. Although, you know, it may just be coming in cheaper than Australia. In Australia, for example, in particular, if um, extraction in the U.S. continues, but you're actually sort of n not using it uh, domestically. But um, the so in in a sense, the major or the decisive sector factor might be, or the a factor that could influence what happens in Europe is the decision on which of the fuels and how much of that is being used for domestic purposes in the US and what is specifically being being sold uh, abroad because you know in theory you could be and you know that is also happening as far as I know uh, in parallel is that there is an increase also in exports of natural gas so these things even themselves out then the price impact on the spread between oil uh, uh, coal and gas prices in Europe might not have a major impact. I think that's it's, it's a little hard to foresee. But it's entirely possible that there's more coal being burned in Europe. At the same time, though, you, and you know, sort of if that happens and you have emissions picking up, then, you know, prices in the e ETS would be picking up, etc. So, you know, there, there are several uh, complex interactions that will be happening. But um, with the ongoing deployment of renewable power capacity, uh, gas is already being pushed out in some countries, especially neighboring countries to Germany. Uh, in the Netherlands, this is a, it's, it happens in, in Germany itself. Gas plants are basically at current coal to gas spreads. Gas plants are you know, not operating at the levels that they were uh, a few years ago because of all the, the additional gigawatts of uh, PV and wind that have been put in place over the last three years alone. Uh, a lot of those plants are just not uh, economical anymore. And, and the same happens, though, with the exports of electricity from Germany to other countries in places like the Netherlands, where um, uh, companies like Essent uh, that are operating the gas plants there are not up running their gas plants. Um, so on, there, there are impacts on the mix. But in terms of the, the company issues, I think that is a, it's a sister company of uh, RWE. So there, is, there are actually companies themselves are able to, uh, to manage these changes because of the breadth of the portfolio that the larger companies have. One, one key issue that I didn't address, and I, I wonder to, whether, uh, to what extent that is an issue here, is that um, with current prices, what they are, um, and the, the capacity that is being put in place, especially the additional renewable capacity, there is no incentive, economic incentive right now to be investing into any kind of new power plant other than renewables. While, you know, so on the one hand, there are coal plants being planned and, and you know, there's, there are one or two reactors being planned, but there are actually new, no new decisions taken and a lot of the planned investments are being uh, rescheduled. No, no, in, in Europe. So there's basically, there are, people are starting to worry about, you know, how does one incentivize still having sufficient capacity of non-renewable plants to also help manage, uh, you know, sort of the, with the, the fluctuations in the, in the timing of the, the production when, when there's no financial incentive to invest in plants that could actually do that in, you know, sort of 10 or 20 years' time. Mm, that's. I'll 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 look into that again. But sort of overall, there 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 is enough uh, uncertainty over these investments, such that capacity mechanisms are being discussed as a relatively hot topic on the political agenda. So the need to f 
find additional incentives to support investments into new power plants. And, and the new coal-fired power plants in Germany are compensation for ones that were much dirtier that are being decommissioned. Yeah. And so on balance, the coal mix is still declining, but it is acknowledging the fact that it's still cheaper than natural mm -hmm. gas. But, uh, but it's, not, it's not resulting in any net increase in use of uh, coal, at least from the figures I saw last week. Thanks, Lou. Um, so in, in Germany, there's obviously the feed-in tariff, which is heavily incentivized to build out of renewable capacity. Um, is there anything or any plans to have a system for incentivizing complementary technologies as well? So like uh, energy storage or um, complementary generation technology, mm. like the plants and that sort of thing. Yeah, so the peaking plans are basically what I just mentioned in terms of um, uh, discussions about um, ways to uh, to make investments in, in in peaking plants, in particular, sort of in all likelihood, actually in additional gas plants, economical because they currently aren't. Sort of, no company will, under current uh, uh, market circumstances, actually build new plants and. So those are there. Are, there are a variety of options. Um, you know, indeed, paying a premium for just capacity existing and sitting somewhere idle is you know sort of is one of the options. Those debates have not advanced very far. They're basically they're really at the overall debate stage. There isn't a legislative proposal. There is, as far as I know, no. You know, the, these are not things that are part of the election platforms of parties where they're sort of ready-made proposals, this is the mechanism that we need to secure that part of our uh, energy production capacity. It's, it's at a level sort of that's relatively sort of technical and part of an, the sort of the energy community. And the same is true and as it's actually less developed a debate is on storage. Um, a main focus right now is not on storage capacity but is on, uh, on strengthening the grids and actually enabling overall load management through better grid management. I'm sorry, we'll have to uh, adjourn with that question. We have another meeting here in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.